Hey, how's it going, everybody? Charlie Wilson here, a.k.a. Sinister Charlie. Welcome back. Uh, yeah, this one just came out. I uh, got more Fat Electrician. Uh, the Barbary Wars, uh, I think, is what it's all about. America dismantles pirate nations for touching their boats. That's, yeah, that's a good way to put it. That's simple. I can understand that. Um, don't touch my boat. Uh, yeah, so uh, I guess let's get into it, I suppose. I got two fancy monitors. I don't know which one to look at. It's a Spectre. It's fine. <laughs> ah, yes, that time the pirates kept messing with American ships. So George Washington. Oh, and my shirt is very shiny. I, I, when I changed the, I know, yeah, people were saying that uh, the last video I was very transparent, but I'm always transparent, you know, and physically apparently. So, uh, yeah, I, just, I, I don't know how to fix this. Sorry, founded I'm sparkling. the United States Navy to do something about it. Yeah, no. the United States Navy was founded for the sole reason oh, of yeah. hunting pirates. Right. Today we're talking about the Barbary Wars. Oh, and my shirt, sorry to keep pausing it. My shirt got delivered, but uh, I can't seem to find it. So hopefully it comes tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, it is pretty it much an ongoing bit. internet joke that you do not mess with America's boats. You know, because of Operation Praying Mantis, that time that America decided they were gonna sink half of Iran's Navy in like eight hours. And, and Vietnam. And and World War Two and World War One yeah and the Spanish American War and the War of eighteen twelve sure. um I guess if you're not picking wars. up what I'm putting down I'm trying to tell you this is the origin story of why you don't mess with America's boats but first a word from our sponsor because this video is brought to you by my favorite underwear company Sheath wait hey. hold on I'm supposed to read a script for this one here's how to do a perfect ad read I'm used to only uh, uh, <laughs> uh was it Legion of Skanks doing uh Sheath. Ads, so our company. Let's take a quick second Sorry. to thank our favorite sponsor for today's show, which is Sheath Underwear. Sheath makes the most comfortable boxer briefs ever worn, and Clarence's parents have a real good marriage. This shit's fucking lame. <laughs> okay, look, here's the deal. Whether you're talking to a veteran, a construction worker, That's or awesome. your dad, they're all going to tell you that there's one universal truth to life, and that truth is that cargo pockets are fucking awesome. Yes, they God are. Damn right. Hell yeah. If you think cargo God shorts are cool, right. wait till you try cargo underwear, except the cargo pocket is made Ooh. with balls not being stuck to your thigh technology. And I know what you're oh, thinking. Yeah. But chubby electron guy, what if I try them out and I don't like it? Cool, just wear them like normal underwear and then you have a bonus cargo pocket. Nobody in the history of mankind has ever been like, damn it, I have too many available cargo pockets. It's never happened. Cargo shorts are not even cute at all. First Get of all, the... cargo shorts are awesome. They always have been. Second of all, <laughs> Get you know out. cargo pocket have in common? <laughs> you don't feel either of us? Ooh. You got flip-flapped. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least I know who I'm not letting put their phone in my pocket next time we go somewhere. Anyways, there you go. if you wanted to try some sheath cargo underwear for yourself or buy some as a gift for your significant other, I'll have them linked in the description down below. And you can use the discount code Fat Electrician for 20% off. Back to the video. All right, here's See. the deal. For three centuries, pirates from the Barbary states of Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli mm -hmm. would raid merchants. Tunis. It's a funny the Mediterranean, steal all the goods, and imprison and turn all of the crew members into slaves. So why was this allowed to go on for over 300 years? Well, the only navies powerful enough to stop these pirates at the time were the Spanish, the French, and the British. And they all came to the same conclusion that it would be cheaper to pay off the pirates, giving them a yearly yeah. tribute to not raid their ships rather than go to war with them. So now those three empires aren't getting their ships raided, which is fine. That's a good thing, I guess. But here's the catch with it that they may or may not have known at the time, but they definitely figured out somewhere along the way. Now the pirates are only raiding all the smaller nations. Okay, it's like Walmart, Target, and Amazon getting together, encouraging shoplifting, knowing that they can shoulder the financial burden, but it puts all the other mom and pop stores out of business and they become the only ones selling goods. Well, Amazon kind of does that already, don't they? Walmart to a lesser extent, but uh, definitely uh, Amazon. Except instead of retail stores, we're talking about entire nations. This goes on for literally hundreds of years, but America is still part of the British Empire, so they fall under their umbrella of protection, so it's never an issue. That is until the American Revolution started on April 19th, 1775, with the shot heard around the world, the Battle of Lexington and Concord, and the famous story of a 78-year-old <coughs> veteran going out into his front yard and shooting three redcoats as they retreated back to Boston, sending the message for all of America that the British Empire should get off 
off of our lawn. Fast forward, 1783, America wins the Revolutionary War, officially becoming its own country, and all of America's merchant vessels start flying the old red, white, and blue. And pretty much immediately, 1784, one of America's merchant vessels is captured by Barbary pirates from the country Arr. of Morocco. As an act of good faith for a new nation, Spain actually pays off the pirates, gets the American vessel uh -huh. and all of its crew back, returns it to America, well, and then nice advises the American government, hey, you guys should start paying these guys off too. That's what all the big nations are doing. At which point, America's minister to France, a guy by the name of Thomas Jefferson, chimes uh -oh. in and he's like, no, absolutely not. I'm going to go talk to him. Now, obviously, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically, Thomas Jefferson rolls up and he's like, hey, don't ever fuck with my boats ever again or else. At which point, the Sultan of Morocco is like, I'm sorry, who are you? I'm Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers of America. You know, we just kicked the British out of our entire country. We're our own thing now. I'm sorry, you fucking pilgrims did what now? We beat the British in war and now we are our own country. You mean to tell me that a bunch of colonial farmers with muskets went toe to toe with the largest military on the planet that is so good at war that they can literally wear high vis red coats the entire time and still win and you beat them. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. I mean, yeah, I could probably just leave your boats alone from now on. That historically seems like it's going to be a really good idea. And that is the story of how Morocco came right to be then. the first country to recognize America as its own sovereign nation by signing the Moroccan-American huh. Treaty of Peace and Friendship, which is the first and longest lasting peace <coughs> treaty in American history. At which point Thomas Jefferson is like, wow, that actually worked out perfect. I'm going to go to the other three Barbary states and tell them the same thing now. But of course, there's going to be a catch with that. You see, there's four Barbary states, but Morocco is the only one that's actually truly independent. Right. And the other three are just subsidiary servient branches of the Ottoman Empire. Um, I like how it says Kingdom of Italy. Uh, that's pretty funny. I don't know why that's funny to me, but it is. So I've been to a Jefferson lot of those places. John Adams go to talk to the ambassador of Tripoli, and they're like, hey, can all the Ottoman Barbary states leave our boats alone? At which point the ambassador informs them, Absolutely not. You see, we're part of the Ottoman Empire. We don't need to listen to you. We're not scared of you guys. And it is our official stance that, and I quote, it was written in the Quran that all nations which had not acknowledged the prophet were sinners. That is was true. The right and duty of the faithful to plunder and <laughs> enslave. You know, unless they give us money, of course. Everything's got a price, apparently. So Thomas Jefferson is like, well, okay, we're going to war then. And that's when John Adams is like, whoa, 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 calm down. Let's just pay the tribute so that our ships can be fine. We already disbanded the Continental Navy after winning the Revolutionary War. We don't have a Navy to fight these guys. We just have to give them the money. So that's what happened. For the next eight to 10 years, America would pay tribute every year to these three... I was going to say something, but I kind of know where this is going. So <laughs> I, I've read uh, I've read about this story uh, this time a couple of times. ...remaining Barbary states, and every year they wanted more and more money, and eventually even that wasn't enough, because Algiers began attacking American vessels anyways. Okay, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you that for the first time in American history, somebody has fucked with one of America's boats, and they're not immediately sorry about it. Yet. The president at the time, George Washington, goes right. to Congress and pretty much tells them what's going to happen, because at this point in time, George Washington is basically the king of America. Nobody actually knows if he's going to step down from presidency or not. So he's like, hey, guess what? You guys are going to pass the Naval Act of 1794, establishing the United States Navy. And at the so very dope. top of that document, it very clearly states that the purpose we are building the United States Navy is so that we can combat Algerine Corsairs, which is just a fancy word for state-funded pirates. Yes, I'm telling you that the founding document of the most powerful navy the world has ever seen at the top specifically states the sole reason for their creation is to hunt down and destroy pirates that had the audacity to fuck with one of America's ships. Hoorah. We've officially entered the find out portion of the story. America immediately commissions the building of six enormous frigates covered in guns to go fight these frigates. I just love that name. That's a good name. Pirates. Fast forward to when the frigates are done. Frigate. It takes a couple years. It is now 1798. And George Washington has decided to step down from power, allowing for an election to happen. And we are now into the second president of America, John, John Adams. Adams. And John Adams decides I already know them. he would rather pretty keep good. paying tribute. Disappointed! <laughs> Hey, America sorry, just created the Navy, spent a million dollars creating all these frigates, and now John Adams isn't going to use them for their intended purpose. Obviously, a lot of people are upset, including his own vice president, Thomas Jefferson. So Thomas yeah. Jefferson, the vice president at the time, immediately begins campaigning to run against the sitting president <laughs> in the next election. That's pretty and nuts. one of his biggest platforms is that he is going to go fight these pirates rather than pay them tribute. Although I, I suppose Mike Pence did that to Trump, so, you know. Kind of. 
dispute. And his slogan for this is, and the thing I quote, things have millions changed. in defense before a cent in tribute. Okay, just so we're clear, Thomas Jefferson's platform for running for president is, I'm going to spend millions of dollars in defense, which might as well be hundreds of billions of dollars at that point, because America no longer negotiates with terrorists. And I'm pretty sure my high school English teacher would refer to this as foreshadowing so thomas jefferson wins the election the entire world finds out that he's going to be the third president of the united states of america and then on march 4th 1801 the day of his inauguration he receives a letter from yusuf karmanali the pasha of tripoli if you don't know pasha pasha is like the dictator the king the president the, the main dude in charge and at this point thomas jefferson the guy who just ran an entire presidential campaign on i'm gonna go fight pirates is thinking Arr. in his head like maybe this guy <laughs> found out that i'm about to send a navy over there to beat him up up and he's going to send an apology. Maybe he wants to sign a peace treaty like Morocco did. This is already working out great. I might not even have to send my Navy over there. He opens the letter and Pasha Yusuf Karmanali has decided that he the is going to poke name. the Pilgrim King because he is now demanding that because of the new administration, the United States owes him an extra $225,000 oh, yeah? in tribute. That's and cool. Thomas Jefferson <laughs> is pissed. Yeah. I'm trying to get crazy with it. I do think uh, Owen Wilson could play a good Thomas Jefferson. Something about the nose. Originally, Thomas Jefferson was going to have to go to no relation, get permission to activate the Navy to send him over there to fight these pirates, but not now. He's so mad, we're activating the rainbow shortcut to ass whooping land, and Pasha Yusuf is going to have some consequences immediately because he's sending the Navy today. But like I said, it takes a literal act of Congress to send the U.S. Navy over there on a military mission. So Thomas Jefferson is like, that's fine. We just won't send them on a military mission. Fill up one of our frigates with a bunch of gifts and peace offerings for Pasha Yusuf, and then give it a nice healthy escort of other frigates to defend it and send them on their merry way to deliver the gifts. Right after he gives the commander of the United States Navy the standing order that he is also to defend any American citizen or ship from any potential aggression not aggression potential aggression okay if he thinks that somebody so, else might be thinking you then, about doing something aggressive take them take them out take them down do your, that's right yeah do your stuff so the navy sets sail they're gone they're in route thomas oh, oh, jefferson oh. sitting in his office and he comes to the realization man I'm pretty sure these pirates are going to attack him but if they don't they're actually going to end up giving pasha what's his nuts a bunch of these gifts and I can't have it. So he whips out the old quill and parchment. He writes a letter back and sends that off. And that letter basically reads, hey, America's done giving you tribute for the rest of forever. F off. And obviously the letter makes it there first, at which point Pasha goes to the American consulate building and chops down the flagpole with the American flag you on it which bitch. in that part of the world is how you declare war. <laughs> so the U.S. Navy shows up off the coast of the Barbary States. The pirates attack them because they've already declared war. The U.S. Navy defends themselves. Word gets back. I don't know if I could fight you seriously while you're wearing a fez. I just don't think I could do it. <laughs> back to America. Congress then is like, oh, hey, we're at war. We're going to go ahead and give Thomas Jefferson permission to use the United States Marine Corps at his discretion. And this is why, to this day, the United States Marine Corps is the only branch of the U.S. military that can be sent and deployed anywhere in the world without congressional approval. Oh, so for the next two years, the U.S. Navy and the Marine Corps set up a naval blockade and just go on a pirate hunting extravaganza until October of 1803, when the USS Philadelphia would get hung up on an uncharted reef right off the coast of Tripoli. The pirates seize this opportunity. They attack the USS Philadelphia, board it, take the crew hostage, and then over the next couple months, they were able to repair it enough to get it back into the harbor at Tripoli, where they then anchored uh. it in place and used it as fixed artillery because it had way more guns than any other vessel they had. Cue our first main character, Stephen Decatur, the commander Hello. of the USS Enterprise, America's <laughs> unofficial flagship. He decides that he's going to don his plot armor, take the USS Enterprise out, and acquire himself a pirate ship, which he does. He then takes that pirate ship and the USS Enterprise and sails both of them to Sicily, where he hires five Sicilian mercenaries that know how to speak Arabic. They then sail back to Tripoli, where Decatur and 80 Marines are going to go below deck of this pirate ship, which has now been christened the USS Intrepid, as the five mercenaries are going to sail directly into the heart of the harbor, pretending to be Barbary pirates. They then go directly to the USS Philadelphia. 80 Marines and Stephen Decatur run out, kill the entire crew of pirates that are on the picture, USS man. Philadelphia, and reclaim it. Unfortunately, the USS Philadelphia is too damaged to actually be used as a ship ever again, at which point Stephen Decatur decides, fine, 
we're just gonna burn the entire thing to the ground because if we can't have it, nobody can. Deprive Ooh. the enemy of nice things. I'm pretty sure Sun Tzu said that. So that's exactly yeah, what they probably. do. They light the USS Philadelphia <laughs> on fire. They're positive it can't be put out. And then they bounce. Not a single American is injured. And Stephen Decatur is hailed a hero because he has now led what is, in my opinion, America's first special operations mission. So now that that's taken care of, the problem at hand is that the crew of the USS Philadelphia is still being held hostage. Ooh, sorry, I take a break. There's a lot of information in there. Uh... Yeah, I know. I know the old Marines song from the from the shores of Tripoli. I, I, I wasn't in the Marines, so that's the only part of the song I really know. Mostly because of uh, Looney Tunes. Uh, that song gets sung a lot in the those pro war uh, cartoons. Anyway by the Barbary pirates <laughs> and they want a ton of money in exchange for them back. However, America no longer negotiates with terrorists and that's not an option. Cue our next two main characters, William Eaton and Presley O'Bannon. And before you ask, yes, Presley O'Bannon, as in the USS O'Bannon, the Fletcher class destroyer oh, from World War right. II that sank a Japanese submarine with potatoes. Paid potato so they crops. go in and they pitch their idea of how they're going to get the crew of the USS Philadelphia back. That story. And it is by every definition, a special operations mission. Basically, they want to take themselves, two dudes, plus six Marines for a total of eight guys, and they're going to get dropped off in Egypt because in Egypt is Yusuf Karmali's brother that is living in exile because Yusuf kicked him out because he is oh. technically the rightful heir of Tripoli. Ooh. So they're going to get that guy and all the buddies that are loyal to him, like 500 men, and then they're going to march them through the desert to Derna, where Sorry. they are then going to use them to fight and take over the city and exchange the city for the crew of the USS Philadelphia. So this isn't a new thing. I think the U.S. has always done this, where we take somebody that hates the current guy and we make them fight. It's kind of, it's kind of, it's early roots, I guess. Philadelphia. And upon hearing this ridiculous plan, the U.S. military leadership is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You want to take a small contingency of men be dropped off in a foreign country, meet up with a rebel leader who already has a bunch of men, and then convince him that you're going to help him overthrow a current dictator, and then he can be the new dictator. And the and CIA we're was using born. using other people to fight <laughs> other people that we don't like to benefit us. And Presley O'Bannon and Eaton are like, yeah, that's, that's pretty much exactly it. And the government is like, this is a terrific idea. I mean, we're probably never, ever going to do anything like this ever again. <laughs> and we're not going to have an entire branch of special forces that specializes in yeah. it. Sorry. Anyways, that's exactly what they do. They get dropped <laughs> off in Egypt. Don't they be track sorry. Down it's true. They're like, hey, you want to go overthrow your brother? Cool. Grab your guys. Let's go. Somewhere along the way, the Marines also picked up 50 Greek mercenaries as they all began uh, marching Greeks. 500 no, miles through the Libyan <laughs> desert to get like back Greece. to the Tripolitan coast. And this march through the desert takes 50 days, and it is a complete shit show because somewhere along the way, they start running low on some supplies and they have to start rationing and then some people get mad there's accusations because the greek guys are christian hamet's guys are muslims there's fighting amongst themselves sure. and there's these eight marines standing in the middle desperately trying to keep them from killing each other as they march through the desert so despite multiple mutiny attempts and a ton of fights the marines were able to keep this group together enough to make it through the Libyan desert till they arrived at the coastal city of Bamba. Once they get there, they la meet la up la with the USS Bamba. Argus that gives them a bunch of supplies so they can start eating food again, and they give enough money to pay off the Greek mercenaries. Then, Eaton decides that he's gonna send a letter over to the governor of Derna right next door, because remember, we can't attack unless they're potentially aggressive. Okay, so he sends a letter and is basically like, hey, I'm gonna march my army through the middle of your town to go kill your boss on my way to Tripoli. Um, can I have some safe passage and maybe some food? The governor of Derna sends a letter back that says, my head or yours, which sounds potentially aggressive enough. So they begin making of. the plan for the ground attack. Hamet <laughs> and his men are going to take the governor's palace, and the Marines and the Greek mercenaries are going to take out the harbor fortress. But to do that, they're going to need a cannon from the USS Argus, so they're going to meet up with it, go get this cannon, some great and prepare names. for their attack. Argus. Cut back to Stephen Decatur. While all this has been happening, there's still been a naval battle in the Mediterranean the entire time, and Stephen Decatur is on an absolute rampage, because after he captured his first pirate ship, he would receive word that his brother, James Decatur, had been mortally wounded by one of uh -oh. the pirate ship's captains well, who was good. pretending to surrender 
before shooting his younger brother. Upon hearing this, Decatur immediately gives command of the new captured vessel to one of his men, leaves a couple guys with him, and yeah, takes off upset. to track down this pirate ship that Probably. just killed his brother. <laughs> so they chase down this pirate ship, they pull up right next to it, and before the crew has time to do any boarding procedures, you know, like break out the planks, tie some ropes to the it's other ship, all shooting. that stuff you see in the movies, nah. Steven Decatur jumps into the enemy ship and starts killing pirates <laughs> immediately. Nine Marines, seeing that happen, are like, oh shit, we're doing this. So they jump onto the pirate ship too and start throwing down, at which point the pirate ship veers off and breaks away from Decatur's ship. It is now nine Marines and Steven Decatur uh -oh. versus over 30 pirates on this vessel, and 30 is not going to be enough. Steven Decatur kills multiple pirates, including the captain that had slain his brother, officially avenging his brother's death capturing that vessel as well but he is still absolutely furious that his brother died and he continues to go on a rampage capturing another pirate ship and destroying three more over the coming weeks cut back to the men on the ground eaton and o'bannon have been getting their battle plan ready this entire man it was so cool like back then you could just like take vengeance and stuff <laughs> like if you were in the military you could just do whatever you want pretty much uh to a certain extent uh yeah <laughs> that's crazy time they just had their men go get a cannon off the uss argus because they really really need this cannon if they're going to be able to pull off this mission so they're ready to attack the u.s navy gets into formation and they are going to bombard the entire city of derna while they launch this attack despite that there's over 2,000 men loyal to pasha yusuf that are going to defend it and they are heavily out pasha ubisoft. so navy starts bombarding the shore hamet and his men take off to go attack the governor's palace and eaton o'bannon the marines and the greek mercenaries begin launching their attack on the harbor fortress they open up with the initial cannon fire, which is going to be vital to be able to break through the enemy lines and establish their foothold. They fire the cannon. As they go to reload and fire it again, they realize that they had accidentally forgot to take the ramrod out of the cannon and Ram shot rod. that at the enemy too. Now the cannon's completely out and they're kind of like, oh shit, what do we do? What do we do? And Presley O'Bannon just charges into battle as the other Marines follow behind him and the Greek mercenaries behind them. They attack so quickly and so violently that they're able to overrun the entire enemy fortress before anybody really knows what's going wow. on. And Presley O'Bannon becomes the first American ever to raise the Star Spangled Banner over a foreign battlefield. This battle, the taking of the Tripolitan coastal city of Derna, is enshrined in Marine Corps history in the Marine Corps hymn with the line from the halls of go. Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Tripoli and it is also where the Marine Corps would get their first nickname ever because the seven Marines present for this battle fought so hard and so violently that they simply became known as the Leathernecks oh, okay. referring to the leather collar that they wore yeah I was gonna say uh, he talked about devil dogs on another one but uh, yeah Leatherneck to protect it from slashes from pirate swords. Oh. So useless men end up getting beaten back and are forced to retreat to Tripoli, at which point the Marines, the Greeks, <clears throat> and Hamet and his men all consolidate, figure out what happened. Hamet and his men were able to take over the governor's palace, and after the taking of the city of Derna, Hamet awards his very own sword to Presley O'Bannon as a gift for how valiantly he huh. fought in battle. And this is the Mameluke sword, the ah. same sword that is on the Marine Corps uniform today. So now Yusuf consolidates his military, sends an enormous army me back to Derna to try to learning take a lot over, and they're kind of just sitting on the outskirts <laughs> of the city waiting for the right moment to attack Eaton and O'Bannon are writing correspondence to the U.S. military in the chain of command like hey we took this entire city with like eight marines give us some reinforcements we're gonna go take Tripoli next and then we'll just overthrow this Same entire Tripoli. country this goes on for over a month and they defend the city multiple times from attacks from Yusuf's men and eventually Eaton receives a letter informing him that he is to stand down and just leave because American diplomat Tobias Locke has struck up a deal with Yusuf Carmenali. And apparently he struck up this deal with absolutely nobody's permission because the deal is America is gonna pay Yusuf Carmenali, the pirate king, $60,000 and in exchange, we are going to receive the USS Philadelphia back as well as a peace treaty that they are going to leave American ships alone from now on. So yeah, everybody's pretty pissed off about it from Thomas Jefferson, Presley O'Bannon, William Eaton, Stephen Decatur. They're all furious that we are now giving $60,000 to this pirate king as opposed to overthrowing his entire city of Tripoli or at a minimum using the fact that they're holding Derna and use that as leverage to exchange. But whatever, the war's over, I guess. For now. For now. So the peace you. treaties were signed in 1805. <laughs> now, fast forward seven years, 1812, the War of 1812 happens. Okay, if you don't know, the War of 1812, there's more to it than this, but yeah. the reason that it started well, is that great... Can't really cover all of it in three minutes, can you? <laughs> 
Britain <laughs> wanted to have more control over the seas and trade because America was getting too much because America was no longer getting attacked by pirates because we just beat them in a war now too. So Great Britain launches another war against America. During this war, they encourage the Barbary pirates to start attacking American uh -oh, vessels again. Good. And honestly, it works out pretty good for the pirates, at least for a little while, because the American Navy is too busy to worry about them because their hands are full with the British Navy. Fast forward two years, eight months later, the War of 1812 ends. Now, luckily for the Barbary pirates, Thomas Jefferson is no longer president at this point. We are on to America's fourth president. Let me beer. check my notes here. Um, James Madison, if no, you don't no. know, James damn it, I missed one. I was like, oh, just John Adams' son, John Quincy Adams. And it's like uh, Van Buren, I think, was like the seventh or something. I can't remember. James Madison is one half of what is referred to as the forefathers dynamic duo, and the other half is his best friend of all time. Thomas, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson. And I don't know if you figured this out yet at this point in the story, but Thomas Jefferson hates pirates. What? So sitting president James Madison, being the homie that he is, looks over at now Commodore Stephen Decatur. Not a One Piece fan. And says, <laughs> Go get him, Tiger. He then proceeds to assemble the largest U.S. naval fleet ever at this point in time and sails directly to the Barbary Coast. He then immediately tracks down Algiers' flagship, the Mashuda, takes it out, captures over 400 members of its crew and the ship itself. He then proceeds to take all of his gunboats directly to Algiers, park them in the port, and say, here's the deal. You're going to surrender and you're never going to collect tribute from anyone okay. ever again or... I'm going to overthrow your entire country. Obviously, okay. they take the first option, at which point Decatur's <laughs> like, okay, cool, next order of business. You're also going to pay me back for all the U.S. merchandise that you plundered during the War of 1812. And they're like, okay, here you go. They give it to him. He then proceeds to sail his fleet next door to Tunis and tell them Tunis. the exact same thing, ordering them to sign a peace treaty, never raid an American vessel again, and then collects a bunch of money. He then sails them next door again to Tripoli, and does the exact same thing, collects all this money, gets the peace treaties, the Barbary pirates never mess with America ever again, Decatur and his fleet sail back home, and he tells the government what happened. The American government is blown away at the results that Decatur was able to achieve when asked how he managed to not only get peace treaties without too much violence, but also get a bunch of money and concessions on top of it. All Decatur said was, peace was achieved through the mouth of our cannons, at which point he was given the what nickname up? the conqueror of the Barbary pirates. And with the rest of the world seeing a new country in its infancy stand up for itself against the Barbary pirates and winning, they would start doing it too. And everybody started fighting back and quit paying tribute huh. to the Barbary Word pirates. Up. And in the coming years, they would fade into nothing as their 300 year reign of terror had come to an end. So in conclusion, huh. the moral of the story is please, for the love of God, do not mess with America's boats. Thank you for watching. Best okay. way to support the channel well, is I'll, I'll about over it. the fatelectrician.com. <laughs> Quack bang. My shirt should be coming soon. It said it was delivered today. I didn't see it. Bang out. I blame the post office, though, so. And that is part one of the origin story of how America became the world police. Yeah. Part two ends after the Korean War when NATO gets founded. Yeah. Well, that's a more, another one. <laughs> Don't get me stirred. Uh, all right. There you go. Uh, another fat electrician in the books. Um, thank you for putting up with my ridiculous shirt. I just saw it after. I... <laughs> that, eh. it's kind of, it almost looks kind of sparkly, you know? Like uh, I should be a go-go dancer. Um, all right. Uh, thanks for uh, watching. I really appreciate it. Please like you and subscribe you down below. Helps me out. Makes me feel good inside. Um, and uh, if you got any suggestions for anything, doesn't have to be Fat Electrician because we're pretty much watching everything. So, um, yeah, if you got any suggestions for anything else, uh, let me know. Uh, and um, bye.